Good morning. Does this work? Good morning. That sounds better. Uh, bonjour. Buenos dias. Uh, merci d'être venu quand même relativement à l'heure après cette magnifique soirée hier. Et je pense qu'on a tous uh, un grand merci à, à dire à notre pays uh, hôte. C'était magnifique et on a eu de la chance, il ne pleuvait pas. Donc uh, aujourd'hui, je pense que personne n'est tenté d'être dehors. C'est très bien pour uh, notre session. Je vais vous guider... Uh, uh, un peu pour euh, cette journée, mais je suis aussi un intervenant. Donc euh, aujourd'hui, on va avoir un certain nombre de sessions. On va commencer par Responsible and Prudent Use. Et euh, c'est mon plaisir d'introduire le chair de cette session. Et je vais le faire en anglais. Euh, donc euh, pour ceux qui ont besoin d'un headphone. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, present uh, Herbert Schneider. Herbert Schneider grew up in Namibia and made his veterinary studies in South Africa and then in, in uh, Germany, many other PhD and also a uh, certificate uh, for tropical medicines. Uh, Herbert joined the veterinary services uh, and worked there for quite a long time in different positions. In uh, 1998, he established his consultancy and uh, he worked, uh, he was elected in 2002 as president of the World Veterinary Association. So he has many different heads and many different experiences. And we took advantage of this experience. Herbert is the chairman of the group uh, of experts of, uh, on antimicrobial resistance, guiding us, bringing us back to focus when needed uh, uh, for a long time now. So Herbert also uh, is working with us for the quality of veterinary services and uh, is working with the OIE for the PVS, and I think that's something uh, he, uh, we will hear, hear about it a bit later today. So how about a hand over to you for this first session. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your kind words. Colleagues, I think we are all in. I think this thing is off somewhere. I think everybody is here. Thank you for being on time especially after this fantastic evening we had yesterday. And I'd like to thank our colleagues, Moroccan colleagues and the government of Morocco for this really fantastic uh, fantasia which we had. I think we are all recovered, at least you look like it, mm -hmm. and we can start off. Colleagues, today I think is the theme of putting things into practice. What are we doing in the field? How are our standards implemented? And I think that is what Elizabeth and David will be sharing with you. Uh, we'll pitch in a few uh, points on the PBS. Then we've got the speech by the World Veterinary Association, which is our biggest private partner from the OIE side. They shared, and we've got a special theme on aquatic animal health, and uh, this will be in, in the Philippines. Colleagues, as you know, the AMR is a shared problem, and as the World Bank said yesterday, we must speak the people's language. Now, I think this is really a big message. We tend to believe if we are sitting somewhere in government offices and universities and we really develop things, we move forward, this is it. It is not. The problem is we must reach the field level. I can tell you of many of my experiences in the field where the words are fantastic at the highest level you would believe everything is functioning per perfectly. Everybody knows about AMR. It's not the reality. It's not the reality. If you go down to district level, Vetni level, in the field, it's a totally different picture. So I think we've got quite a task to go. I'm quite pleased. <coughs> 
compared to five years ago, the first conference we had, we really made progress. And congratulations to OIE and uh, Elizabeth for taking it to the level we are at this moment. I think we have a bright future on that. One of the things we always, and I don't think we deal with it today, is our relationship between the uh, human side and the veterinary side. We tend to believe, and I'm a vet myself, that we know it all. And often, on the medicines control side, on the control of the importation, sale, manufacture of antimicrobials, we must share with our human colleagues. We cannot do it alone. I've heard it so often in the field that our colleagues, my colleagues, your colleagues say, let us do it. We know it better. Uh -huh. Sometimes that might be true. But we need urgently make sure that we do this together with our colleagues on the human medicine side. And just remember one thing, and I think it was very nicely put yesterday by our colleague from Botswana. There must be an incentive to the producer, to the livestock owner, to do all the things we demand from them. If there is no financial incentive, I'm a farmer myself, if there's no financial incentive for me selling my beef or selling my cattle, why should I do it? Why should I attend to all these regulations on antimicrobial use? We are lucky in my side, on my country, we are one of the only two countries in Africa exporting to the European Union, so we know why we must attend to antimicrobial usage, hormonal usage, non-usage of it, because there is an incentive. We can convince our farmers, the colleague said it yesterday from Botswana as well, there is money in it as a farmer to me. Colleagues are mentioning that to bring us down to earth, because our aim is to make us all moving forward on the use of antimicrobials and to combat antimicrobial resistance. Let's start off the day. We've got some time today. The first speakers are Elizabeth, Dr. Ella Findel and Dr. Sherman next to me on this side. They'll be sh doing the first presentation on the OIE strategy on antimicrobial resistance and prudent use. Now, I think you know most of the colleagues next to me. Dr. Elizabeth, qualified from Vienna University, worked for a long time in the French professional dairy organization. And since 2008, she's been part of the establishment of the OIE. I cannot even imagine going to the OIE and not seeing her. She's there. She's our mother of this, what we are doing. Elizabeth, thank you for all your inputs for the past 10 years and more. Just a few days ago, she is heading a new department at the OIE, which is the department for AMR and veterinary products, which is a new department. David, on the other hand, on my left hand side, qualified from Ohio, Ohio State and from Minnesota, doing an MSc. He's a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. He taught at Tufts, he taught at Minnesota, he wrote books, textbook on goat medicine, and he was a state veterinarian in Massachusetts, but what is even more interesting, he served five years as a veterinarian in Kabul, in Afghanistan for U USAID. Today, he is a world consultant traveling the world, works today full-time for the OIE, 
and he's the coordinator for the Whitney Legislation Support Program of the OIE. Colleagues, these are our two top speakers for the first presentation. I'll introduce the speakers as we go along for the next one. Elizabeth, you've got the word. Yeah, I just have to figure out how can I advance my slides because it's not on the screen. Maybe somebody can help me. Um, maybe somebody can put this on my screen because I can advance this on my screen, the slides. Somebody from the technics? No, it is not, but I will try it that way. Yeah, that works. No, it's fine. I will do it that way. So we had two parts and that. Oh, it's fine. Is the mic working? Okay. Oh, we're getting there. Um, I would start uh, with a very short introduction just to know where we are today. We have uh, the sessions, behavior change that was yesterday. We are responsible and prudent use. And today we will also speak about surveillance and monitoring private sector engagement and access to high quality antimicrobials. And I tell this because all this is part of the, of the OI strategy. Uh, I looked at, you know, the OI is a rather old organization and it's always interesting to look back. I found that we have a uh, uh, compte rendu, I don't know how to tell this in English, so I will switch a bit to French because it was in French. C'est Office International des EPS aussi. Et, euh, il y avait une discussion à la session, euh, à la session de l'OIE en 1952 euh, qui était réf fait référence à une autre discussion sur l'antibiorésistance en 1948. Et euh, si vous, je ne sais pas si vous le savez lire, mais le premier le, un point, c'est que les praticiens ne doivent pas utiliser les antibiotiques au gré de sa fantaisie, mais en suivant les règles qui ont été fixées par l'expérience. Et je pense que ça nous parle toujours parce qu'aujourd'hui, euh, l'OIE a travaillé sur une stratégie euh, pour essayer de voir comment on peut avancer tous ensemble. Et cette stratégie a été mentionnée un certain nombre de fois. On a quatre objectifs euh, euh, principaux. Et euh, l'objectif euh, sur euh, improve awareness and understanding, I'm going back to English now, uh, that is the, the part uh, that has been covered mostly yesterday. Uh, and I will go through the others one by one. Um, when we come to improve under awareness understanding, I think that was the session yesterday evening, so I don't need to add anything. I just want uh, to show that one of the points is also speaking about OI guidance, education, and scientific reference material. And there's some more information to come later today on this. And it's a very important point, and that our colleagues are here in the room to collaborate uh, with W2 and FAO, which we have done for some time. And I think this two tripartite collaboration now with a new partner has really been uh, instrumental to have common understanding. That was also mentioned by, uh, by Herbert earlier on. If we come to strengthen and knowledge through surveillance and research, uh, we will have a session and that's what I want to show here. The conference is very much inspired by our strategy. We want to cover and show you where we are on our different objectives. We will have a session on uh, surveillance and monitoring. You will have a presentation, uh, avant première en français, in presentation of the data of the last round of uh, antimicrobial use uh, data collection. What we don't uh, take some minutes to speak about why is, why is most of you are familiar, that's the World Animal Health Information System that will be renewed and that will help us to get better understanding of the animal production of each of the countries. And that will be important later on, on the way how we can calculate uh, the use of antimicrobials uh, in each of the countries and then on, the, on a global and regional basis. And uh, for sure, we have a session on uh, research in, and uh, on alternatives to antimicrobials tomorrow morning. And we have a panel on public-private partnerships with our colleagues here that comes later today. If we come to support for good governance and capacity building, again, the first point on implementation of national action plans was covered and mentioned by Mathieu yesterday, so I don't go through this anymore. But again, we have all agreed as OI member countries on the Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance. Now we have to have a look how we implement this and how each country can implement it. What can the OI do to help what we're doing in the tripartite and how we're monitoring this? And uh, again, you will get in uh, probably next week's a questionnaire asking you to fill it in uh, so that we all uh, have an idea and that we come, come to a global understanding where the needs for the members are to get to the next steps. Uh, 
the next points will be covered by David just uh, after my talk. Uh, and uh, I want to come back for sure for the training of focal points. How many focal points are in the room? Can you just raise your hands? Yeah, I think that's very nice, <laughs> very nice for us. I think we have a network here with the member countries on a more technical level, how we can really work and advance on a technical level. And for sure, our delegates are the ones that guide us and they make the link between the OIE uh, and, uh, and uh, the member countries. So I think we had uh, an opportunity. I think it's the first time that you could invite delegates and focal points and we are really very glad about that. And the last point, again, will be covered by David. The implementation of the OI standards, um, that is the topic of the next years. I think we have we are rather done not so rather well with the standards. I think we are quite stable now. We have adapted our list uh, of antimicrobials of veterinary importance. Uh, we start to work with uh, multilateral uh, or multisectoral uh, colleagues that will be uh, also uh, the topic of the next years. How can we do better here? Uh, quality science-based standards, that's our core work. And again, the collaboration that put the photo that we had uh, with our uh, director general and the other two director generals to see how we can work together and how we can make this, this cross-fertilization and, uh, and uh, information um, uh, between the three organizations and now with UNEP as a new partner. I take my last uh, minutes to go uh, a bit deeper in the standards and uh, guidelines that we have because that's our core business and I think that's the foundation of what we're doing. Um, you know that we have uh, uh, updated several of our standards and that we're going to repeat some of the details because I think that's, there was a strong and long discussion at the last general ses uh, session at the OIE, so I think it's worth reminding where we are today. But again, we have com a complete set of standards in the Terrestrial Animal Health Code uh, where we have an introduction, where we have the surveillance and monitoring of resistance, the uh, monitoring of the quality and usage pattern, Responsible and prudent use, yes, the backbone of many things we're doing and the risk analysis chapter and we have sort of equivalent in the Aquatic Animal Health Code. Something where we had hard discussions and I want to go through this in a detail because I think that was important to understand where we are now. We have, after uh, uh, agreement with all member countries, come up with definitions, what is veterinary medical use? And uh, I think it's important to see that uh, within veterinary medical use, we have the treatment that means administration of antimicrobial agents to an individual or group of animals, and that's probably the specificity of the veterinary sector. Sometimes we have to work with groups. We can't work with individuals for all the species. To control, that's what probably equivalent to metaphylaxis, that's the European uh, term used, means to administer antimicrobial agent to a group of animals containing sick and healthy animals and to prevent, and that's the point that we think that we need to keep in some instances, means to administer antimicrobial agent to an individual or group of animals at risk of acquiring a specific infection. And that means also that prevention is not putting antimicrobials without any veterinary supervision, and there are much more details in the, in the uh, group, uh, in the report of the group that we worked through, what we think is preventive use under veterinary supervision with a target uh, pathogen that you have in mind uh, for a limited time. So prevention is a large expression that I think just creates confusion because it means many things. So we try to fix this. And we also have uh, updated our list of antimicrobial agents uh, with recommendations. I just repeat that we had a recommendation that use of antimicrobial agents uh, in accordance with responsible and prudent use does not include the use for uh, antimicrobial agent as growth promoters. And we have added uh, a second point. The classes in the WHO category of highest priority critically important antimicrobials, that means the highest priority, they should be phased out as more or less immediately because you will see in this latest presentation that we have I think there are some of the antibiotics used for growth promotion that really you can stop this right now 
there's no need to use some of these very precious molecules for growth promotion, while it might be more difficult to get rid of all growth promotion. So we have really tried to put the, ac the accent here of immediate action that should be taken by our member countries. Uh, again, that is something we have added with discussion with our colleagues from WHO. We know that we already had a, a, a restriction on the use of cephalosporins and uh, uh, fluoroquinolones. Uh, we added third and fourth generation of, to be very precise, of cephalosporins. We added the cholestine because cholestine, while years ago was promoted to be used in animals because it was not used in humans, but now it's used in humans because humans don't have enough antibiotics that work anymore. So this has also been reflected in the use in the animal side. And we have to be aware that changes happen and we have to adapt our, our use or our behavior on the veterinary side. So we've added this class uh, to the restriction that we had already had for other molecules. And I think that's a big step in interaction with the, with the human side that we came up to try to make sure that uh, we are following what's happening on the human side here. Again, we also have a chapter. We are just around to update this for the, uh, for the uh, laboratory metals to be used. We will come up, we try to come up with a sort of a table telling what is fit for purpose because it depends what you want to achieve with your surveillance. So that is, please, be, that will be going around for comments. Uh, so please have a look at this if you're interested in this laboratory method, that's coming. Uh, so, uh, and as a reminder, the backbone for what we are here and what we are doing here is the uh, chapter on responsible and prudent use. It covers really from the beginning from regulatory authorities to the use, all the steps uh, defines responsibilities. And that's what we tried to translate into the communication material that was presented yesterday by Katrin in a language that is easier to understand. But that's the backbone of the campaign uh, that was presented yesterday uh, from Katrin. So, just to summarize the first part, the OI strategy combines uh, the, the foundations or the enabling factors, uh, that's the word that Matthew usually uses, the quality of veterinary services, the need for legislation, education and training, and then to use maybe a word that uh, Sally Davis had used yesterday, antimicrobial uh, res related specific actions that are the standards and guidelines specific to antimicrobial resistance, but we also have the standards and guidelines on the quality of veterinary services. Because if you don't have a good foundation, you can't build anything on it. And we have added here the database of the OIE collection uh, and also the material that is the specific uh, communication campaign. And uh, this foundation part will be presented by David and with this I'm going to hand over to him. Thank you, Elizabeth. David, you've got the floor. We'll take questions afterwards. So let's hear David now. Thanks, David. How do I get the program? Yeah, but you, you turned off. You turned off the, but it's not my, it's not our, it's not. Can we go back to Elizabeth's presentation? Because mine is the second half of that presentation. Okay. Well, try to stay awake while we're doing the uh, change. Otherwise, I'll have to ask those guys with the horses and the muskets to come in here and wake everybody up. Okay. Okay. So, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Elizabeth uh, reviewed for you the strategies and standards of the OIE uh, relative to uh, antimicrobial resistance. And now to segue into the second part, I'd like to talk about some of the tools, programs, and activities that we have at OIE to strengthen the implementation of those OIE standards relative to AMR. And I'll talk about five particular programs and sub-programs. The uh, uh, tools and guidelines for those five programs are shown on the bottom, and you can see what they are. They're the Performance of Veterinary Services Pathway, uh, the Veterinary Legislation Support Program, 
veterinary education establishment twinnings program, uh, an ad hoc group on veterinary paraprofessionals, and the uh, uh, International Health Regulation PVS National Bridging Workshops. And I'll tell you, describe these programs to you briefly, tell you what we're doing relative to AMR and how we want to use the information we're getting to move forward and strengthen our involvement in uh, AMR and to strengthen the capacity of veterinary services to address AMR. So, okay. So the first and key program is what uh, Herbert alluded to earlier, which is the performance of veterinary services or PVS pathway. And the PVS pathway is a continuous process to sustainably improve national veterinary services. And it's a cyclical program that feeds back into itself for continued refinement, feedback, and improvement. And the first stage is an orientation stage where we have training programs or workshops we conduct on the sub-regional level for uh, veterinary services staff and uh, government people to sensitize them about what the PVS is, what the procedure is, what can be gained from it. And the reason for that is then the uh, via veterinary services staff are much more ready to receive a PVS mission, uh, to facilitate the mission, and most importantly, better able to utilize the report that they receive after the mission, understand what it's uh, involved and how they can use it to improve their veterinary services. So after orientations, uh, the key cornerstone of the PVS pathway is the PVS evaluation itself. Uh, and what that's also, there's a PVS follow-up, which we can repeat uh, if after five or more years, if a country wants to update their evaluation. Uh, then there's a planning uh, stage or phase where um, the information from the PVS evaluation report can be utilized for uh, strategic planning uh, within the ministry and the vet services. And then there's targeted support. These are specific sub-programs of the PVS, like the veterinary legislation program and education twinning programs, laboratory assessment programs that help additionally strengthen the, uh, the information, availability of information to improve the uh, veterinary service. So what does the uh, PVS evaluation look like? Well, it uses a PVS tool, which is a standardized tool that has 47 critical competencies that are measured during an evaluation mission where a team of two or three PVS experts goes in country for a period of two to three weeks depending on the size of the country and systematically conducts through interviews, discussions, site visits, and document reviews uh, four fundamental components of the, of the veterinary service. A human physical financial resources component, technical capability, interaction with uh, interested parties or stakeholders, and access to markets. Or is there an enabling environment for uh, import and export and safe, safe trade in animal products? So that's how it's done. And to give you an example of, oh, and then for each of the critical competencies, there's an assessment done, give a level of advancement from one, which is basically ineffective, through to five. Uh, which would be highly effective implementation or addressing the critical competencies. So let me give you an example, and I'll give you the most germane example to this conference, which is there is a specific um, competency on veterinary medicines and biologicals. And so what is the team assessing when they look at this particular competency? Well, they're looking at the authority and capability of the veterinary service to regulate veterinary medicines and veterinary biologicals in order to ensure their responsible and prudent use, which I'm sure sounds familiar to all of you. And this includes the marketing, authorization, registration, import, manufacture, quality control, export, labeling, et cetera. So do they have the capacity to uh, ensure compliance with uh, prudent use of antimicrobials and other drugs. And you can see the levels of advancement, one being the least advanced, which is that the veterinary service simply cannot regulate. They don't have the capacity to regulate VMPs. Uh, two is a little better. They have some capability. Three would be a reasonably effective response. So that's, we look 
hopefully for at least a three when we're uh, looking at countries. And we say that for three, the veterinary service exercises regulatory and administrative control uh, for most aspects related to the controls over veterinary medicines and veterinary biologicals in order to ensure the responsible and prudent use. And then four and five are highly effective levels of advancement, which are basically icing on the cake that the countries are doing the best job possible. And in the case of number five, not only is everything in place, but they're constantly auditing it, auditing it and updating it and refining it to make it as good as they possibly can. So that's, the, that's what we assess. And here is uh, some information about what we have found. And we have done, since the inception of the PVS program in 2006, we have 134 countries have invited us to come and do an evaluation because the PVS program is not an audit. It's a voluntary program that countries request because they want to know the situation and, and improve it. So for this particular uh, competency on, on uh, veterinary medicines and biologicals, uh, 32 out of 134 countries were in level one. And 63 countries were in level two. Only 30 countries had achieved a reasonable, uh, effective level of uh, capacity, and only nine countries were above that average. And if we look at that uh, as a percentage, more graphically, we can see that in red and gray, levels one and two, almost three quarters or 75% of the countries that we evaluated did not have the capacity to effectively regulate uh, veterinary medicinal products. Only 22% reached that capacity and only 7% uh, were above that average capacity. So this is, as Herbert said, I mean, there's, we have aspirations and we have realities. And the aspiration is to have effective control. But when we go visit countries and we're on the ground and we're talking to people in the field and doing these evaluations, we're discovering that in fact, the reality doesn't match, and there's a lot of work to do. I will say as a caveat here, it's probably not as bad as it looks because these, this is a cumulative assessment from missions starting in 2006, which is a very long time ago, so many of these countries have since improved. But we want to be sure of that, particularly in light of our new commitment or ongoing commitment to AMR, and Herbert in the ad hoc group on veterinary services has reviewed, and, and his colleagues this past year reviewed the tool, and they decided to add a new competency specific to AMR. So now not only will countries be assessed in terms of their overall effectiveness in regulating VMPs, but also specifically how they will relate, how they address the issue of AMR from ineffective through highly effective, looking at things like uh, do they have a national strategic plan, do they have awareness raising activities? Do they have ongoing surveillance and so forth? So moving forward now from 2018 onward, we're gonna be able to get much more refined information about the AMR situation and the VS's capacity to respond. And hopefully we'll be able to develop new programs and interventions to help strengthen that. Okay, the next program, which is a sub-program of the PVS is the Veterinary Legislation Support Program. And the reason we developed this program is because early evaluations indicated that many countries did not have the capacity to effectively uh, implement uh, or enforce uh, effective legislation. So OIE developed guidelines in 2008, and then in 2012 we actually incorporated a chapter on legislative standards for veterinary uh, medicine in uh, the Terrestrial Code, Chapter 3.4. And then we developed this VLSP program to conduct missions in the field to specifically look at veterinary legislation. And we send a team that includes a veterinarian and a lawyer to sit with the veterinary service and review their legislation. And to date, we've done 61 of these missions. And in, we reviewed these reports in advance of the meeting, and we discovered that uh, while all of the missions look at veterinary medical product legislation, only 23 of them uh, specifically addressed AMR. And interestingly, the pr pr percentage or proportion that addressed AMR was much higher in missions done after 2015, telling us that the uh, global action plan has had a definite impact in awareness raising, both among our experts and the people they were talking to when they were discussing VMPs and looking at the issue of uh, AMR. So, 
I think it's interesting gleaning some of the findings we've discovered on um, the legislative situation relative to VMPs and AMR is that very often there's an illegal, uh, incomplete legal framework for regulation. So Her Herbert earlier mentioned all the different things. There's import, there's manufacture, there's uh, distribution, there's end use, all of the whole range of activities. Many countries have gaps. They're regulating one part but not all parts, okay? Then uh, the competent authority is off for veterinary drugs is often outside the veterinary service with a tenuous legal basis for control in place. What I mean by that is often in the entire body of legislation, there's a single sentence somewhere that says, this competent authority is responsible for regulating uh, drugs used for uh, prevention, treatment, or control in humans and animals. So by adding the term and animals, that competent authority then gets control over veterinary drugs, but often does nothing with that uh, authority. They have no veterinarians on staff, they have no separate department or division on veterinary medical products, and uh, so they lack the expertise to effectively uh, implement the uh, VMP legislation. Then there's inadequate enforcement and resources for enforcement, and we find inadequate regulation of veterinarians and veterinary paraprofessionals relative to the use of antimicrobials, often because uh, the legislation isn't there, there's no veterinary statutory body to regulate the professions, there's no clear guidelines on whether veterinary paraprofessionals are allowed to use antibiotics or not, and all of these things need to be addressed. And okay, and finally, uh, withdrawal times and maximum residue limits are often absent from legislation. Okay. So this is area clearly where we need to do more, and in the spirit of collaboration through the tripartite, we're now working more with FAO on strengthening our capacity to address legislative issues. Uh, FAO Development Law Service has developed this guidance document for national legal consultants on legislation relevant to AMR and AMU at the food and agricultural sector, and they've asked for input from OIE, and at least four of my colleagues have provided input, so we're helping to strengthen this document and put it into use. Uh, we're starting now to add a AMR specific focus to our identification missions, our legislation missions that we're doing in the field. And uh, we are going to work again with FAO and someone from the Development Law Service will be part of our expert team on the evaluation. And you heard yesterday, you saw how active the Philippines is in relation to AMR and the Philippines was very kind. They wanted to have a, a standard veterinary identifi legislation identification mission and we proposed to them, could we do a pilot and test this uh, new approach to specifically assessing AMR during the mission, and they agreed. So sometime in early 2019, we'll do a pilot mission with them on the uh, AMR-specific component, and then try to develop the methodologies to use it in other countries as well. And then the second phase of our VLSP program is to um, assist countries in drafting new legislation, so if we identified gaps in VMP and AMR legislation during the identification mission, countries are, can request technical support from us to help draft additional legislation. And finally, in, legis in the legislative realm, uh, we are gonna be doing uh, shared workshops with FAO on uh, legislation relative to AMR, and we're scheduling one now for the SADC region in Southern Africa in uh, December. Okay. Very quickly, uh, veterinary education twinning, again, PVS showed us that many countries, the uh, veterinary veterinarians uh, who were graduating really did not have the uh, training sufficient to uh, carry out the competencies necessary to fulfill uh, the standards of the OIE or to address the standards of the OIE. So uh, we developed an ad hoc group and developed uh, day one competencies for graduate veterinarians and a model core curriculum. And then we developed a twinning program where uh, developed countries uh, pair with developing countries and specific veterinary education establishments to begin to review curriculum and try to get it to adapt specifically to the model curriculum and the day one competencies. And we have to date so far done 10 twinnings. And at least in the reports we've received in those twinnings, at least seven of those partnerships have looked specifically at AMR in one or more ways, and you can see what they are. They've identified gaps in the curriculum and have done curriculum reform to address them. Uh, they've assessed graduate knowledge on AMR, and when they see that um, 
the graduates don't know about AMR, they're adjusting the curriculum, they're developing continuing education for graduates, and uh, the parent and beneficiary institutions are starting to develop collaborative research in the area of uh, AMR. Okay, getting there. I think I can do it. The veterinary, and so based on the success that we had with the uh, uh, ad hoc group on veterinary education and developing the day one competencies in the core curriculum, which were very well accepted by the educational community, uh, we decided to address this and do the same with veterinary paraprofessionals. So uh, in 2016, we developed a new ad hoc group, and we've developed OIE competency guidelines for veterinary paraprofessionals, and the cover of that document is shown. Uh, we did it for three tracks, animal health, veterinary public health, and lab diagnosis. We developed 16 spheres of activity uh, and 47 competencies in those spheres. Uh, and among these spheres of activity, is uh, one is on the proper use of veterinary medicinal products, and there are at least two, um, sorry, there are at least two of these competencies that specifically address AMR. We want to be sure that uh, veterinary power professionals know the proper use of drugs, including the development of an antibiotic resistance. And number four, we want to be sure that they know how to communicate the proper use of drugs to uh, farmers and herders and make them aware of the risks of antimicrobial resistance by improper use. And finally, the last program that we, um, if I can hit the right button, the last program I wanted to tell you about is the IHR PVS National Bridging Workshops, which is probably the newest program that we have in support of this activity. And uh, the purpose of the workshops is to support the One Health approach. And the Brid Bridging Workshop is a three-day workshop which brings together 50 to 90 staff from the Veterinary and Human Health Services to improve their collaboration at the human-animal interface. And the intention is to identify the strengths and weaknesses in the collaborations between the human and animal health services to better address health events related to zoonotic disease, food safety, and AMR. And we've done 15 of these to date, and there's quite a bit of interest, and there's a lot new ones scheduled in the pipeline, and we're hoping that going forward, we'll be able to put a greater focus on the management of AMR and the interaction between the human and animal health services in the context of AMR. So that's what I had to tell you, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, David, especially for keeping in time. Colleagues, please note your questions. We've got some 10 to 15 minutes at the end of this session. The next speaker is Dr. Sif Noga. He graduated from the Vetni Faculty of Milan in Italy in 2008. And between 2008 and 12, he worked as a Vetni advisor at the European Livestock and Meat Trading Union. He joined the WVA in September 2012, and he's been working there representing the global veterinary profession. He's dealing with different veterinary issues, focusing on international collaboration with a view to strengthen the veterinary profession around the world. See, you've got the mic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schneider, for introducing me so kindly. And also, it's a great honor for me to be introduced by one of my uh, past president and who developed uh, my organization to what we are today. So thank you very much. I would like also to thank to the OIE for inviting me here today to deliver a presentation on the WVA experience and supportive tools to promote use of antimicrobials uh, worldwide. I give a very short introduction of the WVA, the World Veterinary Association, who we are, what we do. Uh, most of my presentation will be focused on the activities of WVA in the fields of AMR, and i then conclude with a short summary. So, <coughs> a little bit of history. Uh, 155 years ago, uh, Professor John Jemji from the UK had the great initiative to bring together veterinarians from different parts of Europe to discuss the issues related to uh, animal health, and mainly related to livestock trade in Europe. The main topic of this first uh, Congress in Hamburg, 1863, was actually ridden, uh, ridden pest. Since then, 
the WVA grew up, and today we are representing more or less around half a million veterinarians around the world. We do it through our 95 member associations. We, most of the WVA member associations are national veterinary associations, but we are also represent uh, veterinary association on different levels, on the local levels, regional levels, and also international levels, uh, organization dealing with the different discipline, uh, disciplines of the veterinary profession. The WVA mission is to assure and promote the animal health, animal welfare, and public health. This is done through the development and advancement of the veterinary medicine and profession. This is actually a very nice slogan, but in practice what we do, we unify the profession around the world, around the different uh, disciplines, and we are trying to speak in, in one voice around the world. We connect the veterinary profession also to other professions, and we support the veteran profession also in deliver, in delivery uh, the responsibilities for the benefit of society and animals. We are, as WVA, very much committed to the One Health concept, where uh, animals, environment, and human are very strongly inter interconnected. And under this aspect, the WVA focuses uh, priorities on five uh, strategic points, animal welfare, pharmaceutical stewardship, veterinary education, zoonotic disease, and of course, the growth of the organization and partnership. And all of them can be considered under the One Health umbrella. In the same way, we are also very much committed to the One Health approach, where veterinarian collaborates with physicians, ecologists, and any other uh, health professionals working together for rich, optimal health for people, animals, and the environment. And in this regards, we have a number of memorandums of understanding and collaboration plans with the global partners and uh, working uh, in different fields under the One Health concept. Sorry. This is a, one example uh, of our collaboration together with the OIE. This is the revision of our collaboration plan from 2015, where we introduce under the One Health um, uh, article, we introduce also um, some objectives for collaboration under the, uh, in the field of AMR, which is a very important section. So, one of initiatives are extremely important for addressing AMR. This is a list of what we're actually doing concretely in order to promote worldwide uh, prudent use of antimicrobials. I will give concrete examples in each one of these um, fields. So the first one is uh, we have a dedicated uh, working group on pharmaceutical stewardship. It's composed by WVA council members and also ad ad hoc experts, members of our member associations. And the vision of this group is that veterinarians around the world must have access to a broad range of unsafe uh, medicine in order to achieve optimal um, health for all animals. <coughs> in addition, and veterinarians around the world must understand the concept of responsible use of medicine and also disposal of medicine and they must understand also the role in decreasing the development of AMR globally. The goal of, the, of this working group is to uh, support research and also disseminate the research re uh, results around the world uh, amongst veterinarians to be used in practice. This working group together with the help of uh, WVA member organizations, uh, we produce a policy on responsible use of antimicrobials. This policy is also uh, include in global basic uh, principles on MOU. And this is used by WVA members when they are, for example, working with the governments to uh, prepare uh, national action plans and is also published on uh, WVA media channels for the wide uh, wide dissemination for the public. I would like to show you now an impact of this position paper, how it actually affects. Uh, some years ago, um, 
McDonald's International use this position paper and they use this as a reference for the expert team of experts to produce the McDonald's recommendation on food and use on antimicrobials in food animals. So we are very proud that McDonald's International use our position paper to recommend uh, better use of antimicrobials. The WVA also offers veteran technical advice. We help our member association to produce their own guidelines or their own position papers on AMR. We also offer, at least we offer our uh, comments and advice to the efforts done by uh, international organizations like the OIE, uh, WHO, and the Interagency Coordination Group on Antimicrobial Resistance when they produce their action plans or the recommendation guidelines and uh, discussion papers. The WVA also helping in collecting data. And this is a good example uh, recently, earlier this year, we worked together with the OIE, we produced a kind of a questionnaire. And uh, we ask all our WVA member association to provide us uh, data, especially with relation to uh, which kind of guidelines are produced in their country. The idea was to create a global repository of available guidelines to identify the best practices that exist and also the gaps exist in the different um, regions of the world. And we received um, 34 uh, replies uh, covering 57 countries. We received access to 48 guidelines that were produced by different levels from the veterinary association to industry, veterinary schools, and also government. And we also received 19 national action plans. Um, the next steps is to finalize the report, the, to summarize all the, uh, res the results we received and to uh, prepare recommendation and conclusion. And the second step is we'll go to investigate further all the guidelines received in order to uh, collect the metadata and to um, uh, produce this global repository. We have different platforms to promote better awareness on uh, antimicrobial resistance. I will go quickly through each one of them. The first one is the World Veterinary Day, initiated by WVA in 2000. The idea was to celebrate the veterinary profession and the contribution of the veterinary profession to society around the world. And every year we are selecting a different team. Um, AMR came back on the agenda several times directly or indirectly. First time in uh, 2012 as raising awareness. Second time in 2017 uh, as going from awareness to action. Uh, since 2008, together with the OIE, we also recognize the best celebrations uh, um, on, the, on the team of that year. This is just to give you an idea how the veteran uh, profession celebrating the day and how we raise awareness. This is from 2017, where the theme was AMR, from awareness to actions, and it's done through uh, different activities, depends on the region, sometimes via marches or uh, school uh, uh, or seminars at school for students, uh, view a few articles around the world, TV interview, and the idea is to raise more awareness uh, to the topic. This is one of the projects that I'm personally very proud of. It's a very good collaboration with the World Medical Association. In 2012, WVA and the World Medical Association signed an agreement of collaboration. Pers from my personal point of view, in the beginning, it was very difficult. There was not so much confidence one in each other. When it came to AMR, there was a lot of, let's say, blaming who is responsible for the development of AMR. I'm happy to say that after some years of working together and collaborate very closely, today is not an issue anymore. We all understand we are all responsible and we are working together to improve the situation. And this is also kind of an example of a global level and follow and our member association in a different country also follow this example. And they also signed uh, on the national levels similar agreement and they continue and started to work together physicians and veterinarians to tackle different uh, issues uh, related to One Health.
this is a, we, we prepare together two global conferences on One Health, one in Spain and one in Japan, together with the medical and veterinary associations. Uh, I put this picture, this is was done in Japan, conference in Japan under the patronage of the uh, Prince and Princess Akishin of Japan. This has attracted a lot of media uh, attention and uh, raised the awareness on the topics in the country. We are now exploring possibility to bring the global conference on One Health to Brazil next year. This is one of the outcomes of the meeting in Japan, Memorandum for Fukuoka. Um, the four organizations agreed on several uh, points, but I would like to raise point number two. Physicians and veterinarians shall strengthen and force their cooperation relations to ensure the responsible use of important antimicrobial and human and animal health care. This is another platform. Every year we are organizing the World Veterinary Congress. One full day is always dedicated to One Health issues. This is done in a good collaboration with the WHO, OIE, and the FAO tripartite. Every year we are uh, choosing different uh, item or different team to discuss it, always under the One Health umbrella. Uh, also in this case, antimicrobial resistance came uh, directly on the agenda twice and indirectly more than once. And, and this is also a good collaboration help us to raise awareness. Together with the veterinary industry, which is a very important part of the equation, we are also working closely with Health for Animals, representing the medicine and uh, the global um, veterinary medicine industry. Uh, we produced an online resource. Uh, this is mainly intended for the public, uh, raise public awareness about issues related to the um, uh, animal health and human health. And also in this online resource, there is a section related to antimicrobial resistance. And um, I will encourage you also to go to the website and look in this uh, resource. The WVA also has a global online education portal. We believe it's the largest pool of, uh, of um, continuing education, continuing veterinary education courses. And uh, we have more than 1,000 courses online. 70% uh, of them are actually for free. And I checked and I found that we have more or less around 30 courses that are related to AMR or to the AM AMU. We also produce articles and press releases on AMR. Uh, I would like to draw maybe your attention to the one that uh, recently was published on the World Medical Journal to address physicians around the world and to give the uh, global veterinary profession point of view on the issue of AMR. So in summary, we are strive, the WA strive for veterinary access to a broad range of safe and effective antimicrobials and promotes prudent use of antimicrobials worldwide using the supportive tools of, of course, uh, veterinary and public health networks, publication of position papers, articles, and press releases, collaboration with the global partners, uh, advocating on uh, giving technical advice, collecting data. We use the platform of the World Veterinary Day and global events and conferences to raise awareness on AMR and prudent use of antimicrobials. And of course, we are using our uh, online uh, continuing education portal to uh, disseminate information and raise awareness. With this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and happy to you.